if you want to... How to code in DNA. So it is a storage talk, and I would like to thank some great people I worked with, uh, two synthetic biologists, one uh, bioinformatician, a bunch of coding theorists. And uh, let me try to get you excited about DNA-based storage and synthetic biology in general, because it's a source of great problems for coding theorists. Uh, very recently, there has been a lot of interest in the bio community to start using DNA as a media for either communicating information, storing information, and uh, all the attempts basically came in the last two, three years, uh, and they received a lot of media attention. So one of the results that I want to bring up came, uh, uh, was published in Nature 2013 by a group uh, that involves two very prominent biologists, Goldman and Bernie, and they tried to play to the media. They encoded DNA in DNA, all of Shakespeare's work. They're stationed at Cambridge. And you see Goldman here looking at a tiny drop of water, which has Shakespeare. It has the encoding of, I have a dream speech, a bunch of images. And obviously, the media took this uh, idea very far, and they predicted that uh, DNA is the new silicon of the future, that one should start thinking about using macromolecules instead of uh, uh, other systems for storing and uh, communicating. And what is interesting is uh, Goldman and Bernie, the uh, people that designed the first DNA-based storage system, uh, acknowledged David McKay at the very end of their paper for pointing out to them what Huffman codes are, what differential coding is, and what parity checks are. So it's, glad, it's very nice to see that, that David McKay was involved in it. And the reason why we are interested, and I think it's really an exciting problem, which is not just there for media attention, but in general, is that DNA has some unique properties that you will not find for other media. And my, one of uh, Michael Jordan, former students, gave a brilliant talk at uh, Urbana recently, where he talked about how we managed to extract Neanderthal genome uh, from roughly 40,000 years uh, ago. Neanderthals went extinct then. And basically, he showed us how using that DNA, which was very well preserved, he managed to find admixture events, God forbid, events where Neanderthals and humans made it in the past. So if you're interested, please check out some of these papers. And uh, why is it a technology that we should trust or believe in? Because of the fact that uh, no system or no technology has been as disruptive as uh, genomics lately and biotechnology. Uh, prices are going down prices of both DNA strand synthesis and sequencing are uh, gradually going down. And in the recent past, they have been going down really exponentially. So uh, synthesizing DNA, you can view it uh, abstractly as a write process, sequencing the DNA as a read process. And there is something like a, a extremely harsh trend of decrease in the sequencing cost of a genome. And that has been well document, uh, documented, and people are using these slides to try to tell you that nowadays we can sequence a whole human genome for less than $1,000. If you go to 23andMe, you can sequence your own genome and get your uh, mutations and everything you probably don't want to know for $99. So uh, if you think of the cost of DNA synthesis, it's a bit high. So to synthesize strands, and this tells you basically the, what we are going to use as block length, lengths of DNA strands, uh, the cost in US dollars is something that digital technology is definitely doing much better. But as an example, for the system that we built when we started maybe two years ago, we used to pay roughly $2,000 for a sequence of length 1,000, which is very expensive. But once we ran the last experiments roughly six months ago, we paid only $200 for the same sequences. So the prices are really going down abruptly. And uh, besides the prices and the costs of these systems, one constra constraint that we have to worry about is that it's also computationally expensive to deal with these systems. And I explain that in more detail later on. But the computational expense comes from the problem of DNA assembly that some of you may have heard about. And the problem is basically one of stitching substrings of a sequence together in a smart and an efficient way. So uh, what did we do? Since this uh, conference is about pr practice to theory, I'll start with practice. We developed the first rewritable and random access DNA storage system. So Goldman and Bernie and Church and uh, Kusuri from Harvard developed archival storage system. And if you read the paper, you will realize that if you want to read one line from Shakespeare, 
what, uh, what's in a name, for example, you would have to stitch every single read together, re basically flip through all his books in order to find that one line. So random access was not enabled. What other, uh, the other thing that was not enabled was rewriting. So we took it up upon us to design a system, a tiny system, don't look at the numbers, uh, where we encoded Wikipedia information. And this was not for propaganda purposes. My student was obsessed with encoding UIUC uh, information in DNA. I wouldn't have been that loyal. I know this is recorded, but don't quote me <laughs> later on. So uh, here's an example of what we encoded, a piece of the information we encoded. And another thing my student uh, was curious about is how to basically change the budget that Urbana has, exponentially decreasing, when we stored information in DNA. So here, here are some of the results. All biology talks have to have some nice pictures, two more pictures, and then we'll start formulas. This here is something that tells you that you should interpret as, yes, we can do uh, random access because we have three tracks here and three stripes, light stripes, that tell you that we managed to, out of a pool of a ton of DNA sequences, select three sequences. The light uh, st light stripes tell you that we got the right length, so we can access we can access the right parts, the right length of the sequences, and then we can read and rewrite them by using amplification methods and methods that are very known in DNA editing uh, systems, known as G-block and overextension PCR, and we can we sequence the data to make sure that we didn't make any mistakes during the rewrite and uh, 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 access procedure. And this is what is called Sanger sequencing. It's a bit costly. Uh, it's a, a method that works for shorter strings when you can do two pass uh, sequencing. We had no errors. You see everything in yellow, which means you can do these processes without errors. But uh, what is disturbing is that all of this was, this pleasure was $4,500. So I'm not saying we're here in terms of cost, but hopefully, in the near future, things are going to look very different. So this was the practice part, a few pretty pictures, or not so pretty pictures. And let's now go to the mathematical model. So as you can only assume, there was a lot of twisting and turning to make the system work. It's not as pretty as I'm going to show you in the next few slides. But we can come up with a slight, let's say, a slight abstraction that will appeal to the audience of information theorists of what we call the DNA storage channel. So let's look at the system from this perspective. So I have a DNA sequence, a strand, and I, I want to use that strand to store information. So the first thing I would have to do as a synthetic biologist, I would have to synthesize the uh, string. So the synthesis channel is the channel where, which allows you to create the sequence, and it obviously introduces errors because it's a sequence of complicated biochemical processes. So let's say you wanted to see uh, synthesize X, you actually synthesize another string, and for simplicity, let's assume that the synthesis channel, as you will see in a second, introduces uh, substitution errors. So for example, you, uh, and I'm showing you everything in binary, the results hold for query channels as well, uh, but it's simpler to show it in binary. So the synthesis channel just view it as a channel which introduces substitution errors. And this is our write process or our, our write channel. And uh, depending on the technology you use for synthesis, the error rates can be as high as 1%. A lot of the systems have lower error rates. So the next thing you want to do is once you read uh, the information, you obviously want to, uh, once you write the information, you want to read it. And this is where we get to the so-called sequencing channel. And this is something that probably we would never think about in our area if it weren't for the bio problem. What is the sequencing channel? It's the read channel. And we don't read DNA as a whole sequence. We can only read DNA based on the fragments or L grams of the sequence. So for example, I had a uh, synthesis error here. You notice that I have a one here. And this information now has to be pushed through a sequencing channel, this string, which will do the following. It will take all substrings, let's say of length L, of this sequence, 1, 0, 1, uh, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, and so forth, and potentially drop some fragments. Because there is a problem of coverage that modern sequencing devices have to deal with. So I don't get to observe all the fragments. I just get to observe some fragments or some uh, substrings of this string. And now I have to read those substrings. 
I have to perform actual sequencing. And what will happen is that some of these substrings themselves will get errors. So for example, I lost the substring and here I have a substring where a one got converted into a zero. And this is the, uh, this is the process of uh, introducing errors during, in, let's say, Illumina machines, which have error rates about 1%. The read lengths are, or the L grams are usually 100, so you can think of L as 100. And what you get is really an interesting input-output channel where you put a sequence in, and at the output you get a subset of substrings which may have errors, and the errors we have are pretty interesting because, first of all, when I uh, synthesize the sequence and I make an error, that error may propagate up to uh, within uh, L L grams, because uh, each of these uh, symbols that was wrongly synthesized may end up in a certain number of substrings. And then each of these substrings may have an individual error in it, and what I observe is a bunch of substrings which, which, uh, that have potential pro uh, potentially propagated error from the synthesis channel and potential sequencing errors and potentially missing substrings. And what makes sense to look at this uh, model is the so-called uh, profile vector or type vector of a substring, because if I'm giving an input sequence uh, 1000 like in this example, the output, the output of the channel will be basically a, a count on how many substrings of certain type did I observe uh, in the mixture. So for example, if I look at this string here, I see that I observed 1, 0, 1. I'll write the 1 here. I observed uh, 0, 1, 1. And I observed it twice because of this error here. So I'll write it twice. And I observed 0 times 1, 1, 1. I observed 0 times 0, 0, 0. And this is what we call the substring composition type or profile vector of the output. And notice that the profile vector of the output is different from the profile vector uh, of the original sequences you started from because you had synthesis errors and you had sequencing errors. So uh, here is the situation again. This was your actual uh, uh, sim uh, set of uh, uh, symbols or uh, bits that you wanted to store. This is the actual profile of the output, while the profile of the input was something else because you made a bunch of mistakes. So this guy here is the profile vector of the input. This guy here is the profile at the output. So uh, then the question of interest is basically how do we code or how do we design code words so that the, uh, at the output, when we observe these profile vectors, we can distinguish the code words at the input. So we have to have some distance measure. And we are going to introduce this distance measure in a pretty simple way. We are going to introduce the distance measure on the profile vectors themselves. So uh, uh, what, is some, what are some of the coding criteria we are interested in? We want to have some error control coding property here. We want the profile vectors of our chosen uh, uh, code words to be as far as possible from each other. So for example, if I get this profile at the output of the channel, and I know the two code words were possible, either this code word or this, what I'll do is I'll compute the profiles of these code words or the types of these code words, and I compare it with the type at the output, and what distance measure should I use? An obvious choice, and this is explained in our paper in more detail, is to use the asymmetric distance between the profiles. So I am going to compute the asymmetric distance by looking at two strings and the maximum of the pairwise differences, sum it up, and then just take the maximum of the, uh, this pairwise distance when I change the order of u and v and v and u. So this is what is well known in the coding theory community as the asymmetric distance, and obviously, uh, based on the description of the system, you can tell that our one of the code design criteria is that we want to have codes which have uh, the property that their profiles after a certain number and types of errors will be as distinct from each other as possible. And uh, yes, please. Sure. But the only thing you see at the output is the profile. Yes. Separate. Yes. So how do you even take a profile and map it back to the... Oh, we have a... Uh, basically what you do is uh, there are different methods. One solution we came up with, we use a DNA microarray 
that gives you light intensity for for it's an array of spots which can eat each one of these spots can identify one substring oh sorry it's not Oh, go ahead. Maybe I misunderstood it. How do you attach your profile back to an X? Oh, oh, I'll talk about that in a second. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, the Broin graphs, the Broin graphs. The answer is the Broin graphs. That's very uh, frequently used. Sorry, I thought you were asking about the biology. Uh, so another set of problems which I won't discuss, but I'll talk a little bit when I describe the underlying graph models for this problem, is constraint coding. And that comes from the fact that we know how, let's say, Illumina sequencers or how the read channels make mistakes. For example, we know that uh, in order for the system to make as few sequencing errors, we need a balance of CG bases, which is roughly 50%. We should avoid some substrings in the DNA, like CGC or huge islands, long islands of uh, uh, GNC symbols. And that gives some very interesting constraint coding problems that I probably won't have too much time to talk about. And uh, in this constraint coding problem, what really comes up is this bunch of fundamental questions. So back to uh, Michael's question. The first question is how do we stitch back together or how do we uh, first basically not stitch together uh, back the vectors or the, the code words from the profiles, but the first thing we want to know is how many different profiles are there. And you can imagine, it's not hard to see, that there exist many words that may share the same profile. So there are actually equivalence classes when it comes to profile vectors, and we are obviously only going to choose one representative from each profile class. And we want to know if we are looking at profiles with respect to that equivalence class, how many different profile vectors or equivalence classes are there. And then the second question we are going to ask is, if we look at this uh, asymmetric distance, uh, how many uh, code words or profiles are they going to be that are at certain distance from each other, certain asymmetric distance? And uh, the new type of codes we call L-gram reconstruction codes. And we can do this for any set of parameters, doesn't have to be binary, the length of the code words is n, alphabet size q, we can change the length of the L, L grams or the strings, which is basically the read length, and we can change the set of constraints we want to deal with on the properties of the reads, and on, on top of it we have a minimum distance constraint. So now to Michael's question, how do we accomplish all this? We really, really need to use techniques from the Broin graph theory, and that work has originated from Pavel Pevsner's group, one of the big bioinformaticians, uh, and it's been used in DNA assembly problems for many years now, probably 20 years or longer. And here is the very straightforward application of the Broin graphs. Just think of the, the Broin graph containing, uh, sub, uh, containing the substring uh, of length L minus 1. So you get your L grams, so take the prefix of length L minus 1 and the suffix of length L minus 1. So, for example, here, if I had L is equal to 3, I would take uh, binary vectors of length 2, and the De Bruyne graph is a graph where it's a directed graph where you go from a vertex labeled by a sequence, in this case 1, 0, to another sequence in such a way that the suffix of length L minus um, uh, L minus uh, one in this case, is the same as the prefix of the uh, sequence that uh, you follow through this edge. So for example, here I have one zero, and this zero is the same zero as this one, and I add an innovation of a symbol zero, so I get one zero zero for the label of the edge. And this is what is standardly known as the De Bruyne graph, and uh, you can extend it was work, very recent work. I couldn't believe that people didn't think about this earlier. You can extend this to restricted De Bruyne graph where the substrings are no longer necessarily such that uh, they cover all the L gram possible, all the possibilities for L grams of uh, strings. So for example, I can only restrict myself to have a specialized De Bruyne graph where the labels of the vertices are strings of certain weight. For example, here, the only nodes you see are nodes where the uh, uh, sequences have length two or um, uh, two or one, uh, two or three. Sorry, uh, two or three. Uh, what we are looking at is really the labels of the edges, not the 
uh, not the vertices. And this is what is called a restricted De Bruijn graph because I'm not going to work with all the, the complete state space. I'm just going to look at a state space where I take strings of a certain form so that the edges have, let's say, restricted weight or some other property. So this is what we call restricted De Bruijn graphs. And uh, here's an interesting property. If we look at closed words in such, uh, uh, closed words meaning words that begin and start with the same L-gram. So this guy here is a closed word because you start with 0, 1, 1 and you end with 0, 1, 1 and we are dealing with L is equal to 3 here. This guy here is not a closed word because 1, 0 and 0, 1 are not the same sequences. If you deal with closed worms, uh, words, then you can associate uh, uh, that word uh, uh, and walks or flows in this graph with the profile vectors. And before I say what the flow is, or before I say how this association comes about, uh, remember this was our input sequence, or let's say the sequence whose profile we are looking at. And you notice that this sequence here has two substrings, one zero zero and another one zero zero. So I will add a flow from this vertex to this vertex of weight two because I have two substrings, one, zero, zero. So it means that if I'm going to do sequence reconstruction, and this is how you really go back from profile to string, I would have to pass this edge twice. So the flows basically tell you how many times do you have to traverse a given edge when you do reconstruction, but it, they also tell you the profile vectors in some sense. And if I have closed words, then the interesting thing is that if I have closed words, then I have a flow preservation property in this graph that says that every, uh, the sum of the flows in, uh, that are incoming to a vertex is equal to the uh, flow at the outgoing, uh, 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 going out from the vertex. And this is something that we will use and abuse in our derivations because we know and we are very, uh, uh, it's very easy to count these integer flow vectors for closed words and asymptotically this doesn't make a big difference because the counts are going to be asymptotically the same for closed and words that are not closed. And so what are we going to do? Something really plain vanilla basically. We're going to cast the counting problem for uh, the uh, uh, paths or flow uh, for, for the profiles as a problem of finding, let me explain this, finding the uh, integer points in a certain polytop. And how do we construct the polytop? We know that we have to have a flow conservation equation for all the profile vectors because we know if you're looking at closed vectors, uh, closed words, the sum of the incoming flows has to be equal to the sum uh, of the outgoing flows. So if U is a profile vector, of a closed word, then it has to satisfy the flow conservation equation where B is an incidence matrix of the graph. And on top of it, we have a, a sum of flows conservation because we would know in advance uh, how many uh, substrings we expect to see. And if you pile these two uh, constraints up, you can uh, get a matrix A and a simple uh, equation that says A times U, where U is a profile vector, is equal to the number of L grams times the B vector, which uh, is uh, 1, 0, 0, 0. And now, counting the number of possible uh, profile vectors or flows boils down to counting the integer points within this polytop. So this is a very interesting connection because it says you can use something that is uh, known as Earhart theory for polytops, and it tells you how to do counting of integer points in rational polytops. And I know I have five minutes or a little bit more, so I'll just briefly tell you some of the most interesting results from Earhart theory. Just one result. Uh, Earhart uh, came up with the idea of something called the lattice point enumerator, and it's an uh, enumerator which tells you uh, uh, the uh, how to take dilations of a polytop, which just means you take points in the polytop, multiply them by a certain uh, dilation factor, and then count the number of integer points in various dilations of the polytops. And this is what is called the lattice point enumerator. And one of his most uh, useful results, at least for our work, is that if you have a rational polytop, then this lattice point enumerator is a quasi-polynomial. And a quasi-polynomial, think of a polynomial that has coefficients 
that are periodic functions. So rather than having coefficients from a certain field, a quasi-polynomial has coefficients uh, that are periodic functions, and it's something that frequently appears in enumerative combinatorics. So quasi-polynomials are not that uh, uh, uncommon in enumerative combinatorics. And uh, what you can do, equipped with this result, you can basically show the following. You can enumerate the number of distinct profiles, and you can enumerate uh, equivalence classes, the size of different equivalence classes, and the uh, observation is basically that these results hold, this, uh, even if you use uh, restricted De Bruyne graphs, and the scaling of the number of profiles is n, where n is the length of the sequence, the size of the constraint set in which you allow your L grams uh, to belong to, and the, set, the size of the uh, vertex set. And uh, in general, finding the coefficient, the leading coefficient, is hard, but you can do it computationally by using a program called LATTE, uh, which uses techniques from a really good professor at Michigan, Barvinok, who I was very happy to take a class with. So if you're interested in enumerating uh, integer points in polytops, check a program called LATTE. Sounds uh, yummy. So. Uh, this is how you do the counting of the uh, integer points in polytops, but I didn't tell you how to construct the codes. And if you remember even at the beginning what I mentioned, uh, to construct the codes we have to ensure very large asymmetric distance. But how are we going to ensure this? Very straightforward, really not complicated. We are going to look at our, rash, uh, our integer points in this polytop, flow polytop that I described, and we are going to intersect those points, the set of those points, with the points that satisfy the Varshamov code constraint. And those of you in the audience probably heard about Varshamov codes as codes that are frequently used for asymmetric error correction, and the codes are defined by using a Reed Solomon BCH code like matrix. Uh, and the constraint that looks very much like Varsham of Tenegold's uh, constraint. So you're taking all the code words that satisfy the property that when you take this matrix, multiply the code word by this matrix, you get a fixed value beta, which uh, uh, modulo p, where you basically have to choose the parameters p and beta carefully. And what you do is now you have to just do some bookkeeping and intersect uh, the set of uh, Varsham of code words with the set of uh, uh, integer points in the polytop and get uh, the resi desired result, which tells you how many code words you have that have profiles at the very large distance from each other. And what is interesting is you asymptotically really don't use, lose anything in the order of the code size. You're still going to get this scaling n to the power s minus vs, a different constant because we have different constraints, but the result carries over in the, in the same way. So a lot of um, th things and results, and I was rushing to finish on time, I know it's lunchtime, a lot of results that I didn't mention, and in particular, how do you reconstruct the words from the profiles, it's obvious you just follow an Eulerian path in the De Bruyne graph, and the Eulerian path will pass each edge once, and if you have edges of a certain weight or flow weight, then you're going to pass that edge that many times, and that's what will give you the reconstructed word. But there are some things that you can actually do in bio hardware to avoid looking at Eulerian paths and computing Eulerian paths, which is what I thought Mike was asking. All those details can be found in the paper. And in the paper, you also have a description of how do we do encoding. And I think Aria brought that up once when we discussed it. Uh, I can construct the profiles, but uh, when it comes to encoding, is there an efficient way to do encoding? We have a systematic encoder, which starts with the partial profile. Fill it out any way you want. It extends it to a valid uh, uh, profile and you don't have to worry about the complexity of encoding either. So there's a lot of work here is compressed into 30 minutes. I'll be around and I'll be happy to talk to you about any more details or more of the mathematical formulation of this problem and other related problems. And just so that it's not just the bio craze talk, I'm interested in other things as well. So if you want to talk about uh, correlation clustering or uh, anything else, Please talk to me. Don't be scared by the bio <laughs> work that I'm presenting here. Thanks a lot. <laughs> okay, any questions to our
I wanted to ask about the read procedure. Is it destructive? No. No, no, no. Because it seems that you have to defragment things into the embryos and then do the profiling. So it doesn't break the DNA molecule. Oh, uh, by nature, reading or sequencing is destructive, if that's the question. You cannot read the technology we have right now don't allow us to read long sequences. We can read only short, very, very, very short compared to the length of the genomes we have, for example. Standard lengths or fragments are roughly 100 with Illumina. PacBio has, can go to 1,000, 2,000, but they have a horrible error rate right now. So by nature, you chop off the sequence, not one. You have millions of copies of the same sequence. You chop it off. Each the copy is chopped off randomly, and then you hope to have large overlapping fragments you can stitch together, together through an Eulerian uh, path problem. So it's destructive, but you have so much DNA, you know, you're not, you take a little sample of the DNA, you amplify it. They're very cheap procedures for amplifications, and then you sacrifice it for sequencing purposes. You have to chop it off. So for each read operation, you need to produce replicas which will be destroyed. Yes, yes, but that, uh, that is uh, not a big deal uh, because you have a solution with uh, many, many, many sequences. You take a tiny amount of that solution, you do what is called a polymerase chain reaction. It's an exponential amplifica amplification that works really, really fast for whatever sample you took. It's an endless supply and the machinery is there to do it very efficiently. So. You're, you, it's, it's not a resource constraint. The problem is synthesizing. It's the right process creates like 10 to 25 of these things anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, oh, when you synthesize it, yeah, you get m millions and millions of those sequences. Yeah. You don't get one sequence, you wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> yes. yeah, I mean, there's a, one thing perhaps I missed, but you know, the length L, it seems to me that very quickly, uh, in the length L, you should get to be able to write everything, right? That there should be no restrictions on what you can write. If you oh, make the L slightly larger, right, mm -hmm. then essentially any sequence you should be able to recover, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's the holy grail of uh, biotechnology, making the reads longer. And as I said, that's a big technological bottleneck. The reads we have right now, most of them are 100, Illumina, 150, maybe 300 with MySeq uh, or uh, HiSeq. How far are you away from being able to reconstruct? I mean, how many do you have to exclude? It seems it should be very little, right? Oh, I mean, uh, how many uh, profiles can I take out? Uh, how many? of all the sequences. Forget about the, the initial errors, because that you can just get rid of by pre-coding, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So assume that the right process is exact, right? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. that's only 1% you lose. Mm -hmm. so, so then just from the read process, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you lose in the read process, you lose a lot of fragments. You don't get all fragments, and you have errors. You could do repeatedly, right? So there's no... There's oh, yeah, 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 you can... Oh, of course, yeah, if you do it repeatedly, right. If you have all the read ones, then, then is there really any problem to reconstruct? There is a problem to reconstruct because of a lot of losses. And uh, you have... You can do it any number of times, right? There's no limitation. I mean, it's not like a channel... But uh, you, uh, uh, the problem is you can do it many times, but the read channel is not really random. Because if your sequence, for example, has very many GCs uh, in a substring, it's never going to fragment in that part because the GCs form very strong bonds, three hydrogen bonds between G and C versus A and T. And so breaking the sequence at that point is not going to happen. So you're going to constantly miss some fragments. And that's called the coverage problem in biology. So the problem is not in terms of repeating because uh, in our case, we can avoid that. We can design the sequence to have a certain GC content, and that's why I brought it up. But for real biology, it's much more complicated. You don't have a control over the sequence, and you may lose chunks of DNA because of the particular structure of the sequence. It's not going to be covered in your reads. And then you cannot do anything about stitching it back together. So there are, this I can control, but for real bio, where I cannot design the sequences, the problems are immense. It's a really difficult question. Sorry, I went way over time. I, can... one, one uh, I was just going to ask something uh, very, along, very much along the line. So when you are synthesizing this, you are taking a hit in terms of rate loss, right? You are, uh, namely the size of the equivalence class of those profile data. Yes, yes. You're basically just getting rid of everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Actual non-synthesized DNA sequence, you don't have any control over no. that. So no. 
You know, as a is there like any, like, so has there been any study where they show that there, there, there is a code, like, is there a error correcting code? No, I mean, uh, just to, to think about it this way, humans are so similar. You saw David's mentioning of SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. We differ so little in our genomes, our code words. <laughs> are really, really close. And what you're really interested in is those places where we differ, and getting that out is really hard. This is Neanderthal DNA, but you cannot say which, which one of them. Uh, I mean, uh, there are only, from what I remember, only three Neanderthal genomes we have right now. And it's easy to say it's a Neanderthal because you get the whole genome. And yeah. So well, let me ahead. ask one quick question. Why did you choose to write long links and not just blocks of 100? Oh. Uh, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. That's uh, I. If we can take it offline, if you want to, or if it. So um, that's what the group from Cambridge did. They took hundred block lengths and they made sure they overlap in exactly twenty-five. They kept. The problem is you need address sequences, and I really didn't want to talk about that because how are you going to do random access if you don't have address sequences, and if you start adding address sequences that allow you to uh, uh, do random access to the 100 length blocks, you're doomed. You, ha you take a huge hit on the rate. So, so this is what we're going for larger block lengths because we can do random access uh, uh, in a much more efficient way. Okay.